Hi, it's Kate, and this is the first video for week two of Math 23. Last week we talked about fields and their axioms. We also talked about the spaces in which vectors live. We talked about linear transformations, the types of functions and specifically which properties they have in order to be classified as linear transformations, matrices, which represent these linear transformations, and how to write down the matrix that represents a given transformation when all we know is what happens when it acts on particular vectors. This week, we're going to go into more operations that act on vectors, a couple of short proofs of major inequalities that will be used extensively throughout this course. We're going to talk about particular linear transformations called isometries, and we're going to talk about how you can use matrices to represent complex numbers and some of those applications. So let's get started. We begin with the dot product. The dot product acts on two vectors and returns a scalar. That is a major property that you should remember. And remember that if we have two vectors in Rn, they're written sort of like this. Here are our two vectors, x and y, and they each have n components inside them. And so we see that in order to calculate the dot product, all we have to do is take the respective components, multiply them together, and then sum all of those products. So we have x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus x3 times y3, so on and so forth until we get down to the product of the nth components. And so this can be written in sigma notation as x sub i, y sub i, where it's the ith components of both the x and y vector being multiplied together, and then we sum all of those products. i goes from 1 to n. Well, let's talk about some of the properties of the dot product. It is commutative, and it's distributive with respect to addition. So what does that mean? By being commutative, the following is true. We see that if we take x and dot it with y, that's the same thing as taking y and dotting it with x. Order does not matter. It's also distributed with respect to addition. So what does that look like? That means that if I took the vector x and dotted it with the sum of two vectors a and b, that would be the same as taking x and dotting it with a and adding on x dotted with b. All right. It also says that in R2 or R3, the dot product of a vector with itself is equal to the square of its length, a concept of geometry. Well, there are a couple things to unpack here. First of all is that if we write the vector x like this, then the way we notate length is like this. And that length is equal to this. Note that this is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem in n dimensions. So clearly, if we took x and dotted it with itself using this formula, we'd have x1 times x1 plus x2 times x2 plus x3 times x3, so on and so forth, plus xn times xn. And so that is exactly the square of the length, and that's what this is saying. Something very good to note. All right, another thing that's great about the dot product is that if you take the dot product with any standard basis vector, it's going to extract the component in the ith place. What does that mean? Well, if I took some vector x, and I'll just pick a random x for this example, I dotted it with the first standard basis vector, it would extract whatever the first component of my vector is, which in this case is 2. Another property of the dot product is that if you take the dot product with any unit vector a, it's going to extract the component of our vector x along a. A picture is kind of necessary to figure out what's going on here. So here's perhaps my vector x and my vector a. Remember that a has to be a unit vector, which means that it is length 1. When we take the dot product of x and a, the result is the length of this vector, which some texts call the projection of x onto a, and is notated like this. So the dot product gives the length of this vector. 
this blue guy right here. Its length is x sub a, and again its length is computed by dotting x and a. If you wanted to write that vector yourself, Note that it's pretty straightforward. It's pointing in exactly the same direction as a, so that's why we have a here, because vector gives us direction. And we know that since a has length 1, we can just adjust the length by multiplying it by whatever this scalar ends up being. As a result, this also means that the difference x, the vector, minus x sub a times the vector a is orthogonal to a. Now how do we picture that on this particular drawing? Well it's this vector right there. And so once I've drawn it out like that it probably should not be a surprise to you that the red vector and the vector a are orthogonal. Alright let's see what else we can learn about the dot product. Long long ago in geometry class you probably learned the law of cosines which can be written as this. If we have this triangle and we label the sides A, B, and C, and alpha is the angle between sides A and B, and C is the side opposite alpha, we can write a relationship between the sides as well as the cosine of angle A. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine alpha. Well, by taking advantage of already knowing the law of cosines, we can find another way to define the dot product. All right, let's name these sides as vectors. Here, side A will be vector x. Side B will be vector y. And as a result, side C becomes the vector x minus y. Okay, well the law of cosines starts with c squared. So that means that we will be starting with the x minus y side and its length. Well, if the side of this triangle is described as x minus y, in order to find its length, look at the third property that we listed of the dot product. In order to find the length of a vector, we need to take its dot product with itself. So that's where we begin. We have x minus y dotted with x minus y. Well, the dot product is distributive by the second property that we listed, and so we can sort of foil the dot product over this subtraction. So we have x dotted with x plus y dotted with y. We also have minus 2 x dot y. Well, let's look at what this means. We know that x minus y dotted with x minus y is the same as c squared. It's the square of the length of that side. x dotted with x is going to be the length of this vector squared which happens to be a squared. And y dotted with y similarly is the length of this vector squared. Since the length of that vector is b, this is b squared. So now we have two very similar looking things. We have first from the law of cosines that c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cos alpha. And we also have c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2 times x dot y. Well, the left-hand side of both of these is identical, and so these two sides of the equation are equal. Both have a squared, both have plus b squared, and now we have a minus 2 times a b cosine alpha and a minus 2 x dotted with y, so that means that x dotted with y is equal to a b cosine alpha, and so that's what we've written down here. For your reference, we put this back into vector notation in this step a is the length of our vector x, so that's that component. b is the length of our vector y, so that's that component. And then we have cosine alpha. So another way to define the dot product is to say that x dotted with y is equal to the length of x times the length of y times cosine alpha, which is the angle between the two vectors less than 180 degrees. Let's mention a very important implication of this. What happens if the dot product between two non-zero vectors is zero? Well, length is always positive, so this component could not be zero, this component cannot be zero, which means that cosine alpha must be zero if the dot product is zero.
which angle measure has cosine of zero? That's right, pi over two, or 90 degrees. That's a really important fact that's extremely useful for you to keep in your mind. First, let's make sure that you take note of this definition of the dot product. Definitely worth a good highlighting. And then second, keep in mind that if the dot product of two vectors is zero, then they are orthogonal to each other. And yes, we considered the zero vector to be orthogonal to all other vectors. All right, worth writing down here. And that concludes the first video for week two of Math 23.